Our next um, our next speaker, we are running just slightly behind time, but don't panic, we'll catch it up, we'll work, we'll manage that for you. Um, so our next speaker uh, is a t tag team between Lisa Castleman. Uh, Lisa has worked in dry land farming systems since 1991, working with the New South Wales DPI Acid Soils Program um, and research team on the master side at Book Book, then a district agronomist uh, for 17 years at Albury, Lockhart and Wagga. Uh, Lisa spent a couple of two years with the Murray CMA working on soils, ground cover and stock containment area projects. Um, Lisa's been with the Riverina LLS since it started in 2013 and wrote the first national online course uh, for Lucent Management. And Lisa has a, an advisory and extension role with the Riverina and manages our Farming Smarter project, which is what she's going to be talking about today. Um, her partner in crime today was uh, Rebecca Walkins, graduated from with a bachelor's degree at um, Charles Sturt University uh, in 2020. During her final year, she completed a three-month work placement with the Riverina Local Land Services and secured a position with us as a land services officer uh, from August last year. A great example of how uh, the land, local land services is working up a relationship with CSU to, to put their um, students in work placement and um, bring them into the industry. Um, so we'll, um, without any further ado, uh, they're going to be talking about the Farming Smarter Soils Project, which is a soils project for the next generation. Thank, thanks, Jeff. This is an exciting project, and as we go through, I'd like to say that there's an opportunity for some of you who are not already involved to come into the project in round four or round five. So it's a five-year project, and it's funded by the National Land Care Program. And so, if you like, that's an environmental fund, a little bit different to GRDC and MLA, where they're collecting levy funds, levy funds but uh, this is about delivering environmental outcomes on farms, and it's funded by taxpayers, if you like. So with this project, we were able to pool a body of soil science, and you've just heard Jason Condon looking for new innovative ways to come up with solutions for subsurface acidity and, um, and getting it right. But we've taken a body of soil science and then emerging technologies, so to do with guidance and variable rate, and put them together for something that we can deliver on farm. There's a number of goals. It's quite holistic, but it is when we're talking about environmental outcomes and sustainability. So we do want to increase the awareness and understanding of soil acidification processes, and it's a dynamic. Like, it, it does change, nothing's static. We, we, we can measure a point in time, but there's processes going on all the time. That's agriculture. We'd like to be more targeted and more strategic with soil testing. And Jason also was just talking about looking at stratification and so you can be strategic about that if you think that you've got a particular layer that's holding you back. We want to increase the area of productive and persistent perennial pastures. There's probably many people in this room that believe that perennials are the way to go in the future rather than annuals. Annuals have their benefits, but they do have that gap over our late spring, our summer and our autumn when the ground is bare apart from the litter that's left behind. And we want to increase ground cover, so manage the risk of health slope and wind erosion. And to do this, we prepare uh, paddock plans or property plans, looking at a long-term sort of lime use and amelioration of whatever constraints have just been found. And we've used one particular way of doing this. There's, there's more than one way, but we've gone with dual depth sampling, so we uh, sample the soil between 0 to 10 and 10 to 20. Those samples are mixed thoroughly and subsampled and then go through a, a laboratory analysis. And why dual depth? Very much the reason that Jason's just put in front of you, that there's this subsurface layer and we have concentrated on the top and with min-till and zero-till systems, there's been less incorporation of lime in the last 10 to 15 years than what there was before. 
that blanket rates of liming have been really widespread. And yes, liming applications might have become more frequent, um, but they're still blanket. They're not picking up the variation within a paddock. And I'll just remind you while we're on this topic that Dr. Brendan Scott had said in a published paper back in 2000, so 21 years ago now, that acidity was a major constraint to crop and pasture productivity. And that still runs true. So previously with soil sampling, we might have used a transect to try and capture the variability across the paddock. Might have used a W to try and expand that variability a bit more. But with our service providers, we're looking at grid sampling and we're capturing a lot more of the variability across the paddock. Um, there's a lot more soil being used for the tests and it's just a better way of getting the variability across the paddock. Um, this is our service provider with their side by side coming out to do the sampling. And um, over the two years of the project, we've had 81 farms and 167 paddocks across the southern and eastern Riverina, um, all within the 500 to 800 rainfall zone, mapping both pH and calcium chloride and the cation exchange capacity from the dual depth sampling. Selected points were then tested for exchangeable acidity, including aluminium and hydrogen. And these selected points were the lowest pH on the farm in both the topsoil and the subsoil. This is an example of the kinds of maps we receive. And you can see in the topsoil, there's a lot of variability across the whole paddock, ranging from the pink, which is 4.5 to 4.7, up to the blue, which is 5.7 to 6.9. And again, in the subsoil, there's still that same variability from pink to blue, but concentrated a bit more in that top corner. So these graphs show the extent of variability across the project's paddocks. And the taller the bar, the greater the variability across that paddock, and the shorter, the less variability there was. The red line indicates our project's minimum target of 5.2, which is a conservative target, but will remove majority of the aluminium toxicity. Where the bars change from blue to orange is the average pH for that paddock. And you can see that majority of the paddocks have an average pH well below our minimum target of 5.2. And um, very few have their average above. And even when they do, there's still a good amount of uh, acid soil. In round two, we had similar results with most paddocks being well below that target. Um, and it's even more noticeable in round two that those paddocks that had a really low average pH didn't have as much variability as those with a higher average pH. Lisa? Thanks, Rebecca. I'll just go back a little bit Jason, uh, I'm not going to quote him exactly, but it was something like, when you don't know you've got a problem, that's a problem. Uh, if you look over on the far left at the most acidic paddocks in this project at the moment that are floating down around that pH of 3.84 in calcium chloride that aren't showing much variability, they're about as low as what you can go. And if these acidification processes are still going on in those paddocks, then what happens after they've got as low as they can go? And what actually happens is that acidity continues to move to depth. So it goes from the 0 to 10, the 10 to 20, the 20 to 30 and below. And in a sort of soil chemical language, if you like, soils become denatured. So the good nutrients move further and further away from the root zone and away from the plants on top. So within the range of participants, we've got pHs ranging from 3.8 up to 7.1. Certainly lots of variability between the paddocks that have been offered for the project. 
and people didn't go and select their most acidic paddocks, not at all. Uh, if you like, people were just asked to nominate paddocks that were going to be sown to pasture within the next five years as suitable for the project. And then in the subsoil, the pH is ranging from 3.9 up to 7.5. So just as variable, but a slightly different range. With the aluminiums, we have between 0 and 60%. The 60% was on the 3.8 pH. Here we just have a chart showing you the relationship between exchangeable acidity and pH. And once we get below that 4.7, 4.8, the exchangeable acidity uh, continues to rise as the pH drops. I tend to think about exchangeable aluminium percentage when we think about the sensitivities of plants that we grow. So we have differences between, say, you know, um, our wheat varieties and then like a, a more acid tolerant wedge tail wheat uh, that you do hear that terminology sensitive, tolerant, you know, pe growers will deliberately target having a little bit more tolerance depending where they are in their liming program or if they know they have subsurface acidity. And then we have sensitive plants that we can have in our mixed farming systems such as barley or lucerne that are more sensitive to aluminium when it's above 5%. And so here, if you look over at the y-axis, uh, up there, 5 is down here through here, 10, we've got a whole lot of paddocks that have got greater than 10% aluminium, even more greater than 5% aluminium, not surprising, but that constraint is going to limit production. So aluminium prunes roots, makes life uncomfortable, changes the, nu the nutrient interactions with the plant, makes things less available. Sorry, the pH makes nutrients less available and the aluminium just makes life very unpleasant for the plant roots. Coming into any project where the end goal is new perennial pastures, naturally we have to look at fertility and get this right before the pasture is established. So there's a comprehensive soil test done over and above on every test because it's not just as simple as mapping pH and the CEC, we also want to know whether there's any other constraints. That's just a reminder, if you look there at the pH of four and a half up in the top corner, if you have a look at the nutrients or the elements that are most available at those low pHs, aluminium that I've just been talking about, iron, that's not a good guy either, manganese, that's not. Okay, I can cope with a little bit more zinc. Um, and if you look over in the middle at the things that we buy as inputs, so the phosphorus and the nitrogen, potassium perhaps, they're more available in that middle range of pH between five and a half and seven. So again, it's just a little bit of proof in terms of why we've got the goals that we do. So as I said, we want to get everything right before we sow the new pasture in. How did we go with our participants with the soil phosphorus? So we had a low of six, which is a paddock that's going to be managed quite heavily because they need to build their soil phosphorus, and a maximum of 120. Uh, the average mean was certainly comfortable, but anything above 25, you know, I'm, I'm quite happy with as an agronomist in terms of um, where we're headed for a pasture paddock. It would be higher than that if it was going into a crop phase. A normal check just to look at the PBI to make sure that even though we've got acid soils that these soils are not locking up a lot of phosphorus and the majority were in a, a very sort of healthy range um, for that particular parameter. Potassium was highly variable and the potassium is an interesting story when Gordon talks about livestock health this afternoon. 
And then sulfur, one of our main nutrients in our single superphosphate or our pasture fertilizers. The sulfur levels, I'd have to say, I was pleasantly surprised that they were higher than what um, I was expecting because sulfur is one of the more mobile nutrients. And the organic carbons, really important characteristic when we're looking at pastures. I mean, we know we put a pasture in if you're a mixed farmer because it's going to build that fertility in that pasture phase as long as it's well managed and increase the soil organic carbon before it goes back into, say, a cropping phase. But a mean of 2%, and I'd really like to see all of, you know, all of our paddocks regardless of what their use was, sitting above 2%. And while it wasn't a focus of the project, if there were any sodic paddocks with high exchangeable sodium or dispersive characteristics, paddocks that are prone to getting very wet, where you can sort of get bogged, that type of paddock that you experience, if that showed up in the soil testing, then that was explored a little bit further for the participants in terms of mapping that as well at the grid layer. So there's an actual paddock in the project, the new tank up near Harden, and it's just showing that there's both a range of pH in the nought, um, from the nought to 10 layer across the paddock uh, most growers couldn't necessarily tell you where the most acidic area in the paddock was, but they could certainly tell you if they're looking at production, where the pasture grows a little bit better or whether clover's stronger or where there's more broadleaf weeds and how it's more acidic than in the 10 to 20. And if you look down on the bottom, which there is a handout on every second chair throughout, um, throughout the room, that this... Uh, soil pH mapping does actually show you how many hectares are within each range. So Jason was really clear in terms of one overall goal about where we want our soil pH to be for optimum plant health for productivity and that was five and a half. And I would endorse that in every way possible. We have two targets in the project. One is a little bit lower and it's the 5.2 where we've wanted to at least remove the constraint of aluminium toxicity given we're about to sow a new pasture in that paddock. And there's an attached incentive for participants in this project of $200 a hectare to sow a new pasture down, a new perennial pasture. And given that some of the paddocks in the, the project are around that 3.8 to 4.5. That's a big jump to try and get up to the 5.2 or the 5.5 if people were going to do it within the next couple of years before sowing down. So we have a target of 5.2, a conservative one, but it's not that I don't have the same goal of 5.5 or above. The second target is if you take both layers into account, and this is for variable rate lime, so addressing both of them if acidity showed up in the subsurface. And then the third is a really long-term way of looking at it, an aspirational target where we do want to lift it to 5.8, very similar to Jason's target of 5.9 in his trial work. So I'll just remind you that uh, lime is relatively insoluble. Chemical reactions take place around the lime particle. That surface area of the lime particle coming into contact with the soil particle is where the exciting, the chemistry sort of happens. And lime applications need to generate excess alkali. And what that means is if there's still more acid um, soil around where all the chemistry is happening, then the lime effect is going to do its work there until it's finished ameliorating some of what's immediately around it. There's nothing left over to go anywhere else. Rainfall is important. Um, it's important in a couple of ways. Where there's been higher rainfall, your risk of the acidity is, is higher. There's been higher rates of acidification. And the rainfall is important in terms of 
that wetting front being able to move down to move any alkali through. So within the project, this table is used to calculate from DPI. And it uses effective cation exchange capacity, which uh, Rebecca said we do some extra sampling, extra testing to make sure that we can validate this for every paddock. So that's what two variable rate line maps actually look like. So the first one on the left, the 0 to 10, uh, is as if we're just liming the topsoil. And the second one is taking its 0 to 20, it's taking both depths into account. If there was no acidity in the 10 to 20, they would look exactly the same. And at the bottom of every page, so it's not just nice and visual in terms of your paddock and what it looks like, there's also a quantity of lime that's going to be required by the contractor down at the bottom. And that's that uh, 5.8 higher target that we talked about. So what about stratification? Yes, it would have been really nice to have had more detail on where the most stratified, where the most acidity was present within each of the 0 to 10 and the 10 to 20. But the lime calculation is, is calculated on a volume of soil. So we're comfortable that the lime required to treat the acidity, regardless of whether it's occurring at seven and a half centimetres or 12 and a half or 15, we've got the amount of lime right. And this is what it's all about. Looking at the soils to get better pastures. So this particular paddock is out near Juni, and this is one of our participants who's both a grower and agronomist. And this is his mix. So it doesn't have a grass in there, unlike many of the others, the perennial grass component. But he's got his perennial in there with the lucerne. And he's got some subs and an arrow leaf and a balanza and a chicory. And what a year it was to establish pasture last year. We couldn't have asked for a better year. That's some more details of the actual mix. Nine and a quarter kilos per hectare. That's about where everyone else is with their new pastures, between about nine and 12 kgs per hectare. We do encourage that diversity, but the decision is, as long as it's a perennial mix, predominantly perennial, it's up to the landholder and their agronomist or their consultant. There's a budget, if you haven't looked at, at one for a little while. Uh, so all of that preparation before the new pasture came to about $110, and there is labour costed in there as well. And then from sowing onwards, including the pasture mix, $269, 270 So about a, a combined uh, 380 in round figures. And I've got some, some below and some above, but it's, it's about average. And that's before you go and pay for the lime. So this is where the Pasture establishment, as it's been said this morning already, is a considerable investment in the future, into those future feed opportunities. There's just another uh, participant's paddock last year with his new pasture. Driving up to them, they look like crops. Driving past them from the fence line, by the time we got to the end of the spring, many of these new pastures were towering over the fences. There's some comments from landholders who've been participating in the first two years. So I'd already had two failures. It's a significant investment. I really didn't want it to fail again and better understand the acidity helps me try and manage that. It's not just data on a soil test that someone's put into a filing cabinet. It's giving people that confidence to make decisions and to make different decisions in some cases. Uh, one from Maringo, we thought the VR maps were going to tell us to use more lime. We've actually needed less. We feel better about it because we know that we've got the amount closer to what's right. Using a blanket rate anymore isn't actually going to help me address the worst part of the paddock, 
because you keep leaving it behind. Understanding where it's different in the paddock, so what was their most productive area of the pasture has actually become the most acidic to their great disappointment, then they really want to fix it because they knew it always was the most productive part of that, that paddock. Sometimes not a nice surprise. And then people putting their own innovative spin, you know, how they're going to use this extra information and use either VR lime and a different contractor or blanket rates of lime and come back and tailor it and sort of get a better fit. So firstly, it's been, as I said, great project to work on. So thank you to our funding body, the National Land Care Program, and to the Ag Service and Rebecca particularly. And for any of you that would like to participate in round four or round five, so we're in our third year now, two years to go, if you're thinking about a new perennial pasture in 2022 or 23, then my email address is on the back of that handout on every second seat. Grab one and we're happy to take a list that will give you advance notice before round four is advertised to give you any and if you like into, into participating in the next financial year. So thank you very much.